Welcome to everybody, uh, to everybody like out there. Hello, my name is Monika Powalisz. I'm a, a co-curator of and Kai Pfeiffer of uh, new project. Um, on behalf, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Pileczki Institute Berlin now. And uh, this is our first webinar and first uh, master class. Uh, today we have a special guest from Poland, uh, Zosia Dzierżawska. And uh, this, is, this is a kind of, uh, this, the today meeting is a uh, part of uh, like uh, uh, very, very like uh, important for us project uh, called like Living Archives. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's support and run by Pilecki Institute Berlin. So we decided with uh, curators and uh, Pilecki Institute uh, of Berlin uh, to have more like uh, public meetings with uh, uh, like comics artists because it's all based of documentary um, comics and and this is Grzegorz and uh, he he will like uh, tell you about uh, some technical details of uh, today's webinar. Yeah, welcome all of you. We are really happy on behalf of the Lesk Institute to have you here uh, in Berlin in your homes or whatever you were right now. Um, we'll start in about a minute. We just wait for all of the people who will join us. Um, jetzt noch auf alle, die zu uns dazu stoßen möchten. Uh, we will hold it in, in English. Um, and we have a German, uh, English German translator, so you can switch your language which you prefer. Uh, it's a button down there um, uh, and on your panels. And uh, I think, yeah, I'm like in, we'll start, let's say, um, in one minute. In one minute. Yes, and uh, also we have very important questions because after the master class, we have like q and A, a Q&A session. So uh, now you can like uh, use your Q&A uh, uh, window to ask, uh, you know, a question to Zosha. Don't uh, hesitate to, uh, to like asking questions, uh, we'll like uh, write all these questions uh, after the master class uh, to Sosha. So uh, I think the, now the screen is yours, Sosha. <laughs> yeah, floor is yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much to have you here. We are really glad to, to, yeah, to have yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, maybe. And that's, that's like, it's in the back, there's a book uh, um, which Sosha, it's Q author, co-author. Uh, she she made it, and that would be that would be really uh, interesting to talk about all, uh, not only the book but but uh, mostly like, uh, mostly about the story yeah, of Eileen Green. Yes, and uh, because we are like uh, all the project and all these seminars and master classes are devoted to documentary comics. So uh, this uh, beautiful book Eileen Green is of course documentary comics about Eileen Green. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Monika and Grzegorz, to the Institute to in for inviting me. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I'm sorry it's not uh, a face-to-face -face meeting, but uh, an online one, uh, but I'm still uh, thankful for the opportunity. Sehr so, dankbar für diese Möglichkeit. Monika und Grzegorz haben three comics in general and my own comic in particular and I will do so happily uh, but maybe I will start with a short uh, introduction uh, about who I am and what I do in general. So my name is Zosia Dzierżawska as you probably already know. Uh, I uh, am a comic artist and an illustrator uh, and uh, I live in Warsaw currently, but before I used to live in Italy for a while and uh, then in Switzerland. Uh, I have very little formal art education. Uh, I studied comparative languages and literature at the Warsaw University here uh, in Poland. Uh, and then I moved to Italy where I finished a postgraduate course in illustration. And this is how uh, I started drawing and making serious comics. Uh, later in Milan, after finishing the postgraduate school, I set up an illustration studio, 
with nine other illustrators, co-workers uh, that is called Studio Armadillo. And we still have a website and we are still like a creative space in the southern part of Milan. So this used to be my home for a longer while. Later, I moved um, to Switzerland and finally uh, I came over to Poland. But because of all this moving around, I tend to work for different European clients. Uh, I started obviously working for the Italian ones when I was living in, in Milan and then uh, also moved on to collaborate with Polish and uh, English and American and other European publishers while working on uh, my own particular um, personal work, so to speak. Uh, okay, I will show you a bunch of slides that I prepared for the whole um, for the whole meeting. Ah, yes. So this is the, uh, the introduction uh, about me, but you know uh, enough about uh, where I come from. Uh, so uh, Grzesz and Monika asked me actually uh, to begin or to tackle somehow during my talk, uh, some very big questions. Uh, and the first of them was, what do I think about the challenges facing the contemporary graphic novel, <laughs> which is quite a big task, I would say. Uh, I am obviously not a scholar, not an academic. I'm just a comic author and reader. So I will talk uh, a little bit about what graphic novels or documentary comics are to me and how they affected my work as well. And uh, I will show you some direct um, connection between the work I've read and what I've learned to the way I created or co-created with Charlotte Malterbart, my latest uh, book, which is Eileen Gray, A House Under the Sun, published last year by Nobrow in the UK and later on also in Poland and in France. Okay, so um, let's say that comics uh, in general have always been the most instinctive and the most um, obvious way to document a lived experience. And this is what they are to me still. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always found like making comics is a great way to process everything that is going on both in your own life and to try and understand someone else's life or someone else's lived experience. And uh, I understand, and so far a lot of people told me that it's not a medium that is um, immediately accessible or understandable to everyone, but uh, I think that it can be an incredibly powerful way to, to simply open a door into someone else's experience and, 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 and show it to you from like very personal autobiographical comics to historical comics, tracing some very complex political or historical um, processes. So um, obviously we uh, have here uh, a, a few of the most famous uh, comics talking about um, historical past, but processed through a personal experience or a family experience, as in the case of, of Spiegelman. So comics can be a great way to bring much closer, bring into our contemporary reality some stories from 100 years ago, 300 years ago, uh, or 20 years ago. Uh, furthermore, I think, and this is one of my favorite sections, uh, maybe, of, uh, of how comics are made. Uh, it's this direct chronicle of everyday life uh, during the present. So not just past experience, but a way to, 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 to process and document in a creative way and somehow put together like the, the, the contemporary reality happening around you. And uh, it can be uh, maybe uh, an almost uh, in the form of a reportage or being embedded uh, with a group of, of journalists following, for example, a conflict like uh, Sarah Glidden did with Rolling Blackouts it can be this meeting of like the personal and the, the public uh, like Guy Delil does who, when he, he, he chronicles his everyday life, but within a very specific 
political context of the different countries he, he, he stays in with his family, but it can also be an absolutely personal experience with very little um, uh, with very little political or historical context, but still telling us a lot about contemporary life and, and its realities. Like in the case of the of the last comic I chose for this slide, which is um, a comic by GP, an Italian author called La Mia Vita Disegnata Male, or My Life Badly Drawn. Whoops, sorry, gone a bit too far. Okay, here I am. Okay. So, uh, so those are the comics that talk about the, 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 the present, or we're talking about the present at the time that they were made. Uh, the final slide here is that I wanted to say that there are also comics that talk about the future, I think, quite well. And I've chosen here uh, two examples that uh, I've recently read. Obviously, you cannot really call them nonfiction because they are talking about events that have not really happened. Uh, both Eleanor Davis is a comic which came out last year and it talks about a very near future. It, it did talk about very near future on the day it was released. Uh, I think reality already caught up with, um, with the themes or the subjects of this book. So, so what was uh, projected as, a, as an idea of the future when Davis was making the book has already started happening, I think, in the United States States especially, but in the world in general. So I recommend uh, having a look. Another uh, book about uh, like a, a, a possible future that is coming both uh, quite shortly and, and quite far off in the future. This exercise in like what the future can look like is l'intervista by or the interview by the Italian comic author Manuela Fior. Mm, okay, so because I've always been so drawn to, 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 to talking about a lived experience and both historical one and the contemporary one, I think it was quite obvious that once I started making comics, they would also be quite close to, 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 to those realities. Um, so here is a, a, short, uh, a short story that was my debut. Uh, I illustrated the script of the here present Monika Povalic. This was like the very first short comic that I published straight out of school. And uh, it was for an anthology that um, talked about uh, everyday life of the Jewish community in Warsaw from different aspects. And here Monika did a, a wonderful job researching um, different uh, real life stories and uh, memoirs and um, diaries of the people from the community and tried to give them a, a graphic novel form, which I enjoyed very much and I was very happy to, to, to make. Later on, I embarked on a pretty huge um, story which is uh, my, my first full length graphic novel, which came out in, in Milan in 2014, I think. It is called Atesta in Ju, uh, or Upside Down, translated more or less into, into English. And it was uh, a book made for a series by uh, an Italian publisher called Topi Pittori. They uh, have this. Uh, they have this section of their publishing house where they publish graphic novels, talking about growing up and different childhoods in different parts of Italy. And I was the first foreigner they asked to to contribute with my own life story, so to speak. So it's like a very low key um, series of black and white books, very direct, very. Um, just a bit of storytelling uh, in which I decided to talk about obviously my, my growing up in Warsaw in the 1980s, the history of my parents and all this family, family everyday family life and family dramas set against this backdrop of big history that was, that was going on at the time. Uh, it was a big project for me because it was one of the first I, I first books I, I actually wrote and 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 drew, and still one of the few that I, I I created completely on my own. So it was quite quite a challenge, but I also a huge learning curve. I learned to 
analyze uh, historical reality. I learned to analyze interviews with witnesses of history, <laughs> in this case, my parents mostly, but also members of the family. I, I analyzed some, some sources uh, like uh, TV programs and newspapers and photographs from, from the period in order to, from this mass of material, learn how to edit it all down into a coherent story that would somehow reflect my own experience uh, in a clear way, as well as um, talk about, uh, as well as be something interesting for, for the reader. The reader here was, um, in my mind, was the Italian public because the comic was published in Italy. So I also explained some historical peculiarities that for, for Polish reader might be obvious, but um, for the Italian ones were a novelty. Mm, here are a few more examples of work that I made that is drawing directly from life, like this short anthology piece for, uh, for the British publisher Nobrow, uh, which also talks about uh, my experience of childhood. And here is a little fragment from an anthology piece uh, called Bricks, which was made for, for the Latvian uh, comics anthology Kush, which in this issue was dedicated to, to different historical themes. And here I departed for the first time after the work uh, I've done with, with Monika from the personal experience. And I tried to talk about something to, uh, that to which I am personally connected, which is uh, my home country and my city of Warsaw, in which I grew up, but talking about lives that uh, I was not directly connected to, and that is the, the different lives of um, Polish architects and urbanists based in Warsaw during um, wartime of the Second World War, the occupation, and directly afterwards. And uh, here again, I worked with a lot of sources with a lot of materials and books and city plans to try and condense all of this historical material into a short story <clears throat> that would somehow uh, bring the leader the reader closer to to this really peculiar situation which fascinated me at the time which was um, an, an underground bureau of city planning and architects which, uh, which was working all through, through the war uh, <clears throat> to try and uh, plan for, uh, for the rebuilding of, of, of the city once the, the, the war was over. Okay, so uh, this is a short overview of what I've done up until Eileen Gray, the, 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 the big comic that came out last year, but before I talk about Irene Gray directly, I wanted to say a few words about um, how I see comics when I work uh, on historical themes and what I think are the, the strong points of comics or the, the, the things that make them really unique and really well made, I think, as a medium for talking about history and a medium of talk for talking about uh, about memory. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, comics are, I think, uh, quite a unique fit for talking about those those subjects. Even if a lot of people immediately uh, connect the idea of comics with something overly simplistic or easy. Uh, or banal or whatever, I think that there is one particularly interesting aspect of comic making and that is um, uh, this meeting of both image and text within a single page. Uh, and I think that uh, those parallel lines that go unlike a movie or, or a book give us an extra space uh, to convey some extra meaning. Uh, because when you follow a comic story on a page, uh, you have to, your brain has to make this leap to, to, to bridge the gap between the text that you're reading and the image that uh, you're following. And I think that's because we have this duality, 
we can uh, we can create a very nice tension between the text and the image, and 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 use it for some very interesting uh, effects, <clears throat> especially when 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 talking about uh, about the past, about witnessing the past, about your own or somebody else's experience, and. Um, I have a little example of what I'm talking about right now from uh, Chris Ware's new book called Rusty Brown, uh, which is not, I think, a, a documentary book. This is fiction. But uh, I think Ware shows very, very cleverly how this disconnect between the text and the image can work uh, in storytelling. Uh, so uh, one of the protagonists of his book uh, books starts telling the story. It's quite, and I don't know if you've read uh, Rusty Brown already, but there is a section in which we follow um, a short story that one of the protagonists has written. And uh, we read through the story, but we also see visuals that accompany the story. And one of the frames, I'm not sure if you can see here uh, correctly, because this being Chris Ware, it's all very tiny. Uh, there is this uh, red-haired main guy um, having uh, in this sort of slightly science fiction contest uh, context and a lady astronaut that he's meeting and training to go on a mission. <clears throat> and on one of the frames we can see uh, uh, where writing the way her beautiful red hair floated around her head like a slow motion fire. Uh, meanwhile, obviously, in this frame and all the preceding ones and all the next ones, uh, the, the, the lady has definitely brown hair and not red. And this is the moment where you start questioning why exactly what is going on at first. I think when I first read it, I went back a few pages to see if I was missing something, but no. Uh, it's a really clever way in which um, where uh sets um talks about how how the protagonist uh sees um oh my god how to explain this it's actually it's a pretty complicated story but uh yeah let's go back what i wanted to say is that through this disconnect through this gap that opens between the text and the image we begin to question what we see and what we read it's no longer a simple science fiction story about a red-haired guy and a brown-haired girl going to Mars or wherever, uh, we start understanding, and this is very really smartly made in this example, uh, that actually while the guy, the protagonist is talking about one woman, he's actually thinking about the other, and he has a lot of implications of um, in his uh, real life story. So this is just one small example of how this gap between uh, the writing and the, and, the, and the drawing can be very creatively used. Uh, and uh, here it is used in fiction, but I think in historical comics, it can be incredibly useful as well to show um, or maybe question uh, the words of the witnesses of history, for example, or if we want to talk about uh, use a narrator that is maybe not completely reliable or maybe is trying to hide something from the reader. It can give us a lot of wiggle room to, 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 to try and show it, not through words, and to say, you know, without describing in particular, oh, he said that this and this happened, but actually I think that something else, blah, blah, blah. But we can, by, by the simple act of juxtaposing the image and, uh, and the text that is sometimes, that sometimes clash completely, uh, we can somehow uh, show the instability of, of, of history and the way it happens. Um, okay, so uh, before I move on, <clears throat> I wanted to make a small parenthesis and uh, mention Meta Mouse because I think no talk about history in comics can <laughs> happen without this book. Uh, and I just wanted to say that I definitely recommend it to anyone who has ever uh, wondered about uh, history in comics and how to um, express uh, the past uh, with in this unique form of, of, of image and text. Because I think Spiegelman in, in Meta Mouse really addresses almost every single 
ethical, aesthetic, and other issues that you may have when embarking on this project of talking about, uh, about a lived experience in, um, uh, in comic book form, in processing a lived experience in, in comic book form. Uh, so this is something um, that was certainly very important for me before I started working on Eileen Gray. And one of the most important parts of uh, that I took away from this book, I think, is that uh, there are no neutral images, which means that um, every, sorry, every angle you choose uh, in your graphic novel, every uh, document, every photograph you decide to base your work on is already is not a neutral element of your research. The, uh, the images you have uh, access to through your research already tell a certain story and the selection you make and then the processing of those images you, 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 you later do when working on your own stuff have a tremendous meaning and practically nothing is, is uh, without consequence when, when you create. Comics, uh, in case of Spiegelman, of course, this iconography was uh, was basically testing, I think, the limits of, uh, of this philosophy, because there he talks about, obviously, the pictures from the Holocaust, for example, uh, and, uh, and the fact that he, he, he chose not to use all the imagery created from uh, in the camps by the Nazis, but only by the prisoners. So giving us a very, very important lesson, I think, about different points of view and of the fact that if you choose to tell somebody stories, you have to be very careful not to adopt a different point of view or to pull back and uh, and use contradictory material to the one he uh, you started uh, working with. Uh, okay, so um, there was a few words about about Spiegelman. And finally, uh, one more aspect of comics uh, and like the philosophy of comics or whatever that uh, was really important to me before I started working uh, on the comics on Grey is the fact that comics and architecture are, I think, a really great pair that go together uh, very well. Mm, and that is uh, because I think when you're writing or talking about art or design or architecture, uh, having this visual side of the storytelling that comics provide gives you a great opportunity to open a window into the mind of the, of the creator you want to talk about. Because it's one thing to write um, a historical dissertation about urbanism or a certain period in art, but it's a completely different thing to actually be able to process it somehow and show it on the page uh, instead of only describing it. So when I was preparing uh, my work on Eileen Gray, I actually, I didn't read too much architecture comics because I also didn't want them to directly influence my work, but throughout the years and out of just personal interest, I, I, I always liked reading comics that, um, were somehow connected to cities and urbanism and architecture also because um, yeah it's a purely it's a really nice subject from the purely visual side of things uh, because when you construct a page of comics it's often like building uh, uh, like building a city or building a, a house you have the different windows that you have to stack one upon each other uh, you have to make some divisions like on a facade, you choose on a rhythm. So in a lot of ways, just the physical act of creating a page of comics to me is very similar to the act of designing a building or, or a city or whatever. So this was also personally a very important connection uh, for me between the, two, uh, between the two disciplines, architecture and comics. And here I've prepared a few examples, uh, like the classic Oster and Matsukeli uh, story, City of Glass, which has a very nice way of, of exploring those subjects, um, not only as a, as a story, but also as the physical space of, of the book. Uh, and two books that uh, are also um, centering about on architecture 
and, and cities. <clears throat> okay, so here we come to my own book, which is Eileen Gray, A House Under the Sun. I can see it, I've chosen the Polish version of the cover over here. Nevertheless, the book first came out uh, in English with the UK publisher Nobra uh, last year, and it was soon followed by the Polish and French editions. There is a Spanish coming as well, I'm more than happy to say. And uh, so uh, I wanted to go back to all I've said before and, and say that when I started working on, on Eileen Gray with, with the book's co-author uh, Charlotte, we already knew that uh, we wanted to construct a book that somehow takes into account all the complexities and uh, all the aesthetic and visual possibilities of this, this meeting of comics and history and biography and architecture. So it was quite a huge challenge <laughs> to start working. I'll say maybe a few words about who Charlotte is before I, I go on because it's quite uh, quite important, I think, to the way the, the, the book was made or the way it happened. So Charlotte is uh, an architect, she's an academic, she's an urban designer, and she's currently an assistant professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Uh, when I met her, she was still working at the ETH, which is the um, Zurich uh, Technical School, the Polytechnic. Uh, where she was teaching and finishing her PhD uh, in the architecture department. Uh, but apart from being a, a teacher and a researcher and an architect, she's also a very vocal uh, activist. And uh, she's involved uh, in a lot of initiatives uh, uh, regarding gender equality in architecture. So she, for example, organized a series of uh, discussions and and meetings at the at the Zurich Technical School called Parity Talks that went on for the last five or six years I think that talk about um, this incredible uh, gender imbalance that is still happening in architecture and trying to to get to the roots of of why is it so that uh, nowadays there is a lot of uh, female um, architects studying at technical schools, but when actually you look at lists of, of, of architects working in the field, they are mostly male. So she is um, working through publications and organizing debates and meetings um, in order to, 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 to raise those questions. But she's also interested uh, in the past of architecture uh, and the way uh, that women have been uh, have been present or not present in, in architecture's history. And this is one of the reasons she was incredibly interested in Eileen Gray and in the work that she has done, uh, but also uh, in the way her Gray's achievements in the field of in the field of architecture, which in many ways are quite unique and really groundbreaking, have been completely, uh, have been uh, taken away at some point from, from the history of architecture or disappeared for, for a number of years and are only slowly coming back now in a form of uh, academic publications. There she is obviously a subject of, of a few monographs, but it's mostly very specialist and very niche uh, publications. And so uh, Charlotte, who has always been uh, very fascinated as one should be by Grace life because she's quite incredible. Uh, she be closer to a non-specialist, non-scholar, non-architect reader. Uh, and that would somehow make, uh, make her life attractive. To, to such people. Um, so originally this book was supposed to be an opera <laughs> and I think Charlotte started writing the actual <laughs> libretto to the opera, uh, but she soon abandoned the idea um, and went in a direction that would be maybe more accessible to more people and started developing a script for a graphic novel. And this is more or less the time when I met her 
uh, we were at the time, I was living in Zurich, just like she was. And we were sharing a, a co-working space uh, in which one day we simply started talking about our, our work and our future projects. And she told me that she had this beginning of a script in her desk <laughs> that she wanted to, 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 to make into a comic. And I will have to say that after I read up, because I have to say, I didn't know much or almost nothing about Eileen Gray before I met Charlotte, uh, that once I read about who she was and once I listened to Charlotte explain um, the different incredible elements of her life, I was quite intrigued and I decided that we should make a book like this together. It would be a great opportunity also for me to, to use my own interests uh, in in comics, which is, as I mentioned before, both both historical and biographical, uh, real life stories, uh, as well as art and architecture, uh, etc. So during that time, also almost immediately after we decided to work on this together, I got an email from Nobrow, the UK publisher, asking if maybe I had some projects in development. So we pitched with Charlotte, the Eileen Gray story to Nobrow, and they decided that they are interested. So we went on to work and to try and tell Eileen Gray's life story and show her fantastic designs to, um, to, to the reading public. So, um, because of all of the experience we both had uh, reading comics and talking about comics and uh, creating historical narratives or narratives related to, to, to real life events. And because of Grace particular and unique life, we knew from the very beginning that we didn't want to make a traditional illustrated biography. So we were not uh, interested in sitting down and telling her story from A to Z, starting with Eileen Gray was born on this day and then blah, 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 went to school, went on to, 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 to make on, uh, I don't know, to study art and then design this building and then this happened and this happened. We were quite sure that this is not uh, the way we wanted to, 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 to tell her story. However, we were quite unsure how to, how to do it uh, otherwise. So uh, we uh, worked with a lot of sources since Charlotte collected a lot of, um, a lot of actual material about Gray uh, in libraries and archives, especially the Fondation Le Corbusier in Paris, but also other places. Uh, so we had this volume of, uh, of material with her plans, her photographs, who she was, her, her notes on design, etc. Uh, but we struggled to put it all together in a coherent story that wouldn't be this A to Z classic, I don't want to say boring, but, uh, because it doesn't have to be boring, but, but this biography that, that just told her her life story, we wanted to convey her philosophy, her design, her outlook on life through the book and in the form of the book and not only uh, in the content of the book. So here you can see one of the first pages from, uh, from the sketchbook uh, in which we brainstormed ideas and scenes. Uh, and as you can see, it was quite a violent process in which we started writing pieces of her life like little vignettes uh, and then deciding that they don't work and supplementing them with other vignettes and working through, through different, uh, different ideas. And the thing that we noticed from since the very beginning is this very, uh, here is Eileen Gray, the subject of the book. So the thing we noticed about her uh, straight away was something, uh, all, was her incredible, whoops, her incredible life, uh, in which she really seemed to constantly reinvent her persona and um, in her different capacities and the way that she managed throughout like the 20th century to be basically a lot of different people doing a lot of different things and this multitude of of of, uh, of identities was something that we really wanted to to convey in the book 
since she was born a young Irish aristocrat and then she moved to Paris to study arts. So she became this Bohemian art student who then worked uh, uh, as an ambulance driver and pilot during the First World War. So she took on very masculine attributes um, uh, and, and jobs in a time where it wasn't obviously uh, a typical thing to do. She continued with the bohemian life in Paris of the of the 20s and 30s, where she was basically a cross-dresser, uh, often posing as a man in different public situations. She started an interior design store. She moved on to, to architecture. She designed an actual house. So there was a lot of different Irene Grace, we felt. And we wanted to talk about all of them or wanted to make sure that this multiplicity of, 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 of character and experience is somehow present in this book. And one of the, because we, the book has only so many pages and we knew we couldn't mm -hmm. actually talk about all of this in the under 200 pages that the book has, uh, there is an echo of this, this incredible, um, multiplicity in uh, the way the book opens and closes, as you can see, I can show you how it looks like in the actual story when you open, you see the different, uh, different ways that, um, that Eileen Gray, the, the different people that Eileen Gray used to be from this aristocratic debutante from the beginning of the 20th century to like, a very cutting edge bohemian cross-dresser of the 30s. And the other thing that is reflected on the other side of the book is her designs, which also uh, reflected in a way her evolution as a person as well. So she went from designing this incredibly ornate art deco pieces with uh, a lot of flourish and lots of fantasy and slowly distilling all her experience into those minimal and simple yet genius uh, pieces of design. Uh, and so uh, those pages are not parts of the actual story per se, but they accompany the book as this kind of bookends of, 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 um, of like trying to compress uh, someone's life experience into, into a short visual, uh, visual metaphor. Uh, Okay, so uh, I mentioned before that we were um, having uh, quite a lot of trouble with trying to figure out uh, the way to tell Eileen Gray's story. Like we decided we didn't want it to be too, uh, too obvious, too, too, too linear, but uh, we, didn't, we weren't sure how to organize all those different vignettes of, of Gray's incredibly varied and, and different life into a story. And uh, the breakthrough moment came when we visited um, the E1027, which is the house, the most important and the most famous house that uh, Eileen Gray designed and practically built almost entirely herself on, um, on the Côte d'Azur, quite near Nice. And actually, uh, and I talked uh, about this more extensively during uh, um, during the study um, study meeting on the, over the weekend. But visiting this uh, this space that Gray designed actually made a lot of ideas much clearer for us, because uh, being inside the physical space designed, uh, Eileen Gray was literally like a little bit like walking into her mind. You can immediately tell that this is a very private space in the sense that you can really sense that it's an emanation of Gray's entire life philosophy and the way she feels life should be lived and the way she understood the rhythm of the day. Like you can see from the way the different rooms are planned, the, the sequence of the rooms, um, the way in which they catch the sun, the way the house is positioned on the, on the slope. Uh, those are all personal choices. This is not a house in which she decided, oh, it's got to have a bedroom somewhere and a kitchen and a bathroom and let's just put it here and here and this may be the most optimal way or blah, blah, blah of placing things. Every single element of the house is really thought through, not only in, um, uh, in a technical way, 
but also in an, in an emotional way. Like you really understand her way of life when you walk through the different rooms of that house. Uh, including the kitchen, which is basically attached practically outside because she really did not consider cooking a valuable activity. And <laughs> she kicked the kitchen out of the main floor plan and just attached it as an afterthought uh, to the building. <clears throat> so, um, uh, yeah, so the moment we, we, we took a tour walking through the house, we spent some time there thanks to the owners there is a currently a foundation that is taking care of the house and you can visit it on a guided tour once we said that we were making a book about gray they let us in and they let us spend there a few hours inside just taking in the atmosphere and, and analyzing uh, analyzing the space we we understood that the way we wanted to, to tell the story was not as a progression through time as in eileen is born does this does that dies but as progression through space. So we want the book to be like walking inside her house and discovering different rooms within the house and hopefully coming out again with a little bit of knowledge of, of who she was and the way she thought about things. Mm, this is why uh, the, oh, here are a few more pictures of the documentation we made. Uh, so yeah, this is why the book, uh, the structure of the book is based not on a chronological progression of Gray's life, but on uh, a single day, 24 hours inside the E1027, which is once again, the name of the house. Uh, and uh, so the main time frame basically only, only <laughs> uh, shows uh, Eileen Gray having living experiencing the house from dawn until through the afternoon till dusk till nighttime and in the morning again we see her during her 24 hours inside it and only we see her wake up have breakfast meet her partner of the time jean badovici the romanian born architect who motivated her to, to, to construct the house. <clears throat> uh, and uh, we see both of them basically just being, being in. Uh, and this is it, this is more or less the book, uh, only that it is interspersed with flashbacks and flash forwards to all those different periods of Ian Gray's life uh, and to the house's future uh, already without Eileen once she once she left because it was quite quite turbulent. So uh, so inside this 24 hour time frame we have little snapshots of uh, of of life from different contexts like from the time Gray used to live in Paris and 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 worked in the design store and and was part of like the Bohemian crowd there. We see Anne Gray as a small child uh, in this very peculiar country manner in which she grew up, uh, etc. And eventually we see as well, and this was one of the toughest uh, pieces to, to, to illustrate, or one of the biggest challenges of the book, we see what happens to the house once she is gone. Uh, because, and basically the ending of the book once uh, Gray breaks up with her partner Jean Badovici she leaves the house to him this is what 19 19 oh my goodness let me check the dates so that I do not lie uh, 1933 is the time she, she 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 decides to leave she leaves him in the house she never comes back and one of the reasons she never comes back is because Badovici's friend Le Corbusier decides to visit the place and gets quite obsessed with it. And in order to show his appreciation of the space that Gray created so personally and so meticulously, um, and making it so strongly her own, uh, so Le Corbusier decides to express his appreciation of it by painting a series of murals inside of the house. And those murals are if you see them live there, they are truly 
horrible things. Uh, and because of uh, Le Corbusier's intervention in the house, Gray decides to never, ever, ever go back because she feels that the space has been truly violated and, and imposed upon through this arrogant gesture of, of, of Le Corbusier. <clears throat> so we knew that the house was going to finish the way it did. Uh, changed in a profoundly inside by, by Le Corbusier's paintings. Uh, and yet we wanted the book, and this is pr probably also because of the fame of the, of the, of the person who did the murals. Uh, it is often considered the most important part of the building's history. I mean, it only finished in architecture reviews and the design history because of the murals of Le Corbusier. The actual design, the fact that Eileen Gray designed it the way she designed it was only recognized many years later. Like it first appeared on the radar of, 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 um, of architecture history and, and design history because of Le Corbusier's murals. And actually to bring back the, uh, the story of the house from before the murals uh, is the latest work of, of, of different scholars and, and academics. And this is also what we wanted to do. We wanted to talk about Gray. We didn't want to talk about Le Corbusier. So this is one of the reasons where, why within the book, the story of the murals comes quite late. I mean, we're mostly, this is like one of the last flash forwards in the book, the chapters. You have only a few pages showing the moment of creation of the murals. We did decide to, to, to include the, the act, of, uh, the act of painting them by, by Le Corbusier. We showed the way the house looked after this, inter this intervention. And it's, it really is shocking. Like once you, when we visited the house personally with Charlotte and we saw all the care and tiniest details that Gray took when designing this house. And then you see those massive, loud, super <laughs> masculine, murals just splashed along the walls it's really <laughs> it's quite incredible how 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 out of tune with the with the house house's spirit and, and these principal principles of design those murals are so we do we do show this intervention this intervention because we want to show what happened and why i mean gray was forgotten for so many years or why for so many years the house was considered to be a le corbusier creation because it was. Um, so uh, we do show the scene and we do show, uh, we do show the murals. But once uh, you turn the page, this flash, flashback or flash forward finishes and the last scene we see and the last scenes in the book are actually go back to our 24 hour original time frame in which we see Eileen Gray wake up still in this pristine original space that she designed and she owned fully and she felt at home in. And so the book ends with uh, sort of in this magical um, turning back of history and, and rewinding the horrible things that happened <clears throat> in, in E1027 once she moved out. And we actually finished the book with, uh, with her being very much the owner and the creator of, of, of the place without bef from, from, from before the, the, the destruction, the destruction happened. <clears throat> okay. So uh, I think this is more or less everything I wanted to say about uh, about the book's structure and the way we, all, all the choices we made with Charlotte when, when, when wanting to talk about Eileen Gray's biography and, and making sense of it and making it, uh, making a story out of it for, for the reader. And I wanted to ask whether you have any questions or you would like to ask for any clarifications or if there is anything else you would like to know about uh, about the whole thing yeah yeah please use this uh, this function below your panels to to ask us and Zosha questions 
uh, Q&A. Uh, so we are waiting. If we we can we can start. Yeah, discussion with uh, I think very important uh, uh, point because um, there's like uh, one question, uh, like long description. Um, so your book has been uh, reviewed uh, enthousi enthusiastically by the New York uh, Review of Books. From your point of view, how would you describe the dominating reception by the media? And have uh, they registered that huge potential documentary comics actually offer of the, uh, or have uh, they missed the type? Because, uh, because, uh, uh, because you, during our like um, lab meeting, uh, you said uh, that were like some, you know, comments uh, from the American uh, readers, yes, about this uh, reception of this uh, Eileen Green. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good question <laughs> because, and it also shows you that you can put a lot of thoughts in uh, in writing and creating something, but you cannot obviously control the reception of the book. Uh, and this is, I mean, we do feel with Charlotte that the book has exactly the shape we wanted it to have, like this is the way we wanted to tell the story. But this also means that if you come into the story and expect to come out knowing about Eileen Gray and everything about her life and uh, having an easy um, story, this is not the place for it. And some of the reviews, and I do mention it, I did mention it during the, the study talk over the weekend, some of the reviews were very confused because, and this is not only from like reader opinions on Amazon or wherever, uh, I think Publishers Weekly, there are a few of those really important reviews that come up once a book is published in the US. Um, and a lot of, there, there were quite a few comments. I think yeah, more in the US than in Europe. I think in Europe there was, a, you could see a, dif a difference of understanding of, of what a comic is or should be, or the way it tells a story because a lot of the American reviews were confused and they called the book fragmentary or unfinished or not enough uh, or not, cl not clear enough or confusing exactly because of its, uh, because of its peculiar structure and because of the choices we made with, with Charlotte uh, in order to show Eileen Gray's life, not in order to, to teach the way, you know, she lived and evolved, but to more and try and try show her um, design philosophy or personality and also in the rhythm of the story and not just in like drawing the designs that, that, that she made. So definitely, I would say that the reception was quite mixed and this is why I was so incredibly happy when I read the New York Review of Books uh, review. But I think it's also not a coincidence that the author of the review knows a lot about Eileen Gray's life already. So he actually came into this book knowing things <laughs> about her that uh, made his reading much easier, I think. And this is why um, I, yeah, there was no confusion as to like, hey, who is this person and what is happening here now and why are we suddenly jumping in time? Uh, and one of the interesting um, phrases that he used in the, in the review is that the book is absolutely, it, it, uh, I can't remember it exactly, but he said that the book is very or incredibly plausible, which means that he, he, he really felt like reading through this book that, yeah, this is more or less what it could have looked like and that made me uh, I thought that was a, like a really interesting and, and fun thing to happen but this is also why uh, the book does I mean the story within the book does not come on its own uh, at the end and this was also our editor's idea I mean there is an afterward uh, and there is a who is who so at the end you can actually check who Irene Gray meets and why. <laughs> and you have all the important people in her life with the, the dates and the backgrounds and the explanations. So there is a map and there is a bibliography. So the extra information is 
inside the volume as well if you if you want to look for it to to somehow um, complement the the actual story within it. But when it comes to 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 other um, other media outlets and the book's reception, I, I yeah I just assume that not everyone will get <laughs> the book's point, and this is also absolutely absolutely fine. And that uh, that quite a number of people did did enjoy this this kind of storytelling and like this disjointed, fragmentary but purposefully fragmentary uh, kind of storytelling. Uh, I think we are back. Sorry yeah. for technical problems. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, Sasha, you mentioned that that you have a do you need to fight for the uh, the um, uh, the overall uh, idea of the book with the publisher. So tell us more about this fighting. I know that you uh, you already uh, designed it as as you, as you, as you as you wanna. But uh, but what was the point of the publisher of this book? How how it how it she or he or them uh, um, prefer this to pick the story of of Aileen Green? Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, okay, yeah. So uh, because uh, the book was originally written as a series of scenes and not like a, an A to Z story. Uh, we did also mix and match quite a lot ourselves with Charlotte when we were writing it. Like we were putting different scenes, juxtaposing them, seeing if they work together, if this time frame is working with the other time frame, and seeing how, what, what the effect was. Like, what about if we put Eileen's childhood in the first 10 pages? And what if we then show her in her later life, etc.? Mm, so we were quite happy to move things around uh when talking with our publishers as well i have to say that the editors which is not always uh, my experience and um, but it was the case here and, and and i'm quite grateful for it the editors were actually very happy to uh to question our choices <laughs> but I, I i i say it in a good way like they, we would really spend maybe not hours but a lot of skype meetings uh we had in which we discussed uh, and sort of defended with Charlotte on why did we choose to place this scene here? And why did we decide to, 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 to cut short the explanation there and just move it to the end of the book, etc. So um, it was actually, I do appreciate that the, that the editors were, were, well, I wouldn't, you, you call it fighting. I would say it was a fight, but in a good way, like it was a, a confrontation of, of, of choices that made us really think of why did we choose this particular scene in here and why do we not want it there and the thing that the example i mentioned uh, in the previous talk is the very opening of the book in which uh, 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 something very dramatic happens so to speak uh, since Le Corbusier was quite obsessed with the property itself i mean with both i mean grace house and the setting, he, he couldn't buy, I think, the house himself, but he managed to buy or convince his investors to buy all of the land around it. And he subsequently built his own designs all around Alien Gray's house. So he kind of enveloped, apart from making the murals inside, he sort of enveloped it in, in his own projects all around. Uh, and he eventually also quite famously drowned in front of the, the, this piece of land with his own. Uh, designs, but most importantly, like right, literally in front of the house, he 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 lost his life, and we knew that uh, it seemed like a natural way to finish the book as well. <laughs> but uh, as in the case uh, of the murals, which I mentioned before, if we showed, if we finished the book with with Le Corbusier's death, it would once again be a book about Le Corbusier, <laughs> and you know, when you finish reading, what you are left with is Le Corbusier's creations. And Le Corbusier's death, etc. So we really did not want it, and it took us quite a long time to figure out where to include this piece of information. And and eventually, I think it was Charlotte who had the brilliant idea of placing the scene at the very opening of the book. So you begin the book, and there is no Eileen Gray in the first chapter. 
she's not even mentioned. The first few pages you see Le Corbusier taking a stroll down to the beach and going for a swim and disappearing in the waves. And you see the local people gathering on the beach, realizing someone died. And they mentioned like, oh yeah, that's that famous architect who, who built this house on the hill. Uh, and this, we chose to, to, to put this in there to also show that for many years, this is how the house and the area was considered. It was considered Le Corbusier's creation. And like he left such a strong mark on the, on the area that, that he completely covered the whole house's history. Uh, and its actual creation but by Eileen Gray. And uh, our editors were not happy about this because they were like, come on, this is a book about Eileen Gray. <laughs> Why do you talk about <laughs> Le Corbusier only <laughs> over the first few pages? Uh, but this is exactly like, this was also a very, a very conscious choice on our, on, our, uh, on our side because then we could get Le Corbusier immediately out of the way. We literally kill him off on page six. So we can go back to business and then talk about the person. You want to talk about another uh, question from uh, Caroline. Uh, how long uh, did it take you to finish creating the book, especially the drawing process? How long it took me to, to finish the book? Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so it's as those of, if there are people listening who make comics themselves, they know that comics are ridiculously time consuming. They take a lot of time. Uh, we started working on the book uh, with Charlotte, I think in 2017, but that was the writing part and the conceptual part and the research part. And I started drawing it at the beginning of 2018, I think. So it's taken me from like the first early sketches to submitting a publishable um, files about a year, a year and a half, maybe. The book is, let me see, yeah, 160 pages of drawing. So uh, this was a conscious choice once again on my part because I really did not want to spend uh, a lifetime making this book. I already <laughs> had the experience of making my the personal book I, I made about my own childhood, which took me I think three and a half years and it was like a very slim black and white volume of work and I, uh, I, I decided I just did not want to live <laughs> like this spending my life, spending my life drawing. So uh, we really wanted it to be, be quite a dynamic uh, tempo of work. But this also meant that I, to be able to draw this entire book in, in a year, year and a half meant drawing like 10 hours every day, seven days a week for at least three or four months. So yeah, this is also a strategy I maybe do not recommend, especially for people with back pain <laughs> <laughs> okay so we have another question uh did the book have a black white color scheme the paper the paper itself is it glossy uh big threads uh, uh, a concern of the communicate i I'm, I'm concerned of the communicate communicative uh process yes so this is the mm -hmm. um, uh this is asks from Nate Stevens. Okay, so uh, yeah, actually the color is something I was meaning to mention in my main talk. So thank you for asking this. <laughs> uh, so in order for the reader to make it a little easier to differentiate between all the different time plans, because we have this, the, the flashbacks, the flash forwards and everything, we decided to use a different color for every time time period okay so originally uh we wanted to make the book in like those very strong flashy primary colors that gray herself used in uh, designs especially when she when she wrote about the book i think i have it's somewhere here but this is a reprint of 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 her and badovich's analysis of, of the house itself but uh, yeah so she made when she when she described the different um, 
how the house should be, the, the, the distribution of different areas in the house she used those very strong primary colors, like blue, red, yellow, to indicate what she meant or what kind of, um, what kind of use should a given space have. So we, at first we wanted to make the book like this, primary colors, like we knew it would have color some, somehow. But then when we visited the house itself and we saw it was like all beautifully white and light blue and this incredible light from the sea coming in because there's like the, the, the main living room, like this huge balcony, the house is very, very open to, to its elements around. So like the wind and, this, and the sea that is changing color and the way it influences the, the color of the, of the walls in the house during the day, we saw that light and dark are the most important parts of the house. And this is where we scratched all our color ideas. And we decided to, to make the, um, all the, well, let me go back. Yeah. All the parts that happen inside the house, just with this marine blue that permeates the, the, this incredible light that, that, that the God does you have, has. Uh, so this is it. And in order to make it for clear for the reader that the flashbacks that are happening are happening in a different time frame completely. Each flashback, um, so this is still the, the, the original time frame, each flashback has its different set of colors, like Paris is pink and blue, and the childhood in Ireland is green. And in this way, we, 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 we try to help the reader to, to, to understand that some things are, are happening in a, in a different moment. Okay, so uh, this is my personal question. Um, I have, uh, because uh, uh, I know that after she left Padovici and she never visited this house again, uh, she built uh, her, that, like, her own, uh, the second house, yes? Yeah. And uh, um, do you know, uh, or did you visit this, the second house also? No. Uh, and uh, do you think about, like, uh, uh, Mm, prepare or write or some like you know to, to do you think about the part two about this the second <laughs> house <laughs> because it's like I'm, I'm constantly like thinking uh, about like uh, uh, about the, the, this moment uh, uh, then she like uh, decided uh, never like visited this house again from my perspective it it was like uh, kind of tragic tragic not tragic but a strong decision yes because uh, you put her all her like um, you know feelings uh, emotion the talent uh, into this house yes so that's I'm asking about the second one yeah I think it's called the town uh, Paya but and it's not far from the original house but first of all it's in private hands so you cannot visit it because just I think simply someone just lives there Secondly, uh, I don't know because I haven't seen it in person, but they say it's not as accomplished as E27. So it's not as groundbreaking when it comes to design. Uh, it's not as spectacular. It's not as innovative. So there, it, because it doesn't have any design or architectural interest, no one, I think, cared to actually try and make it visitable or public or, or whatever. Uh, the thing that I know that uh, is quite incredible inside the house is because for, for both houses, she designed all of the furniture herself. And all, a lot of this furniture is site specific, so to speak. So she really uses the angles and the spaces that she had available to like implement some really fantastic design ideas. So like the whole house with the materials inside it, uh, it was considered to be like this one one almost organic uh, being that, 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 that in, in which everything complemented each other. So she took a lot of care with the choice of the materials she used, for example, like the tables could only be made with this kind of wood and with this elements of, I don't know, aluminum or, or whatever. And I know that some of Her most, uh, most of the pieces that you can see inside the house right now are recreations because once she moved out and uh, Badovici then sold off the house, I think. Mm. 
and there was a, a number of, of different tenants there. They didn't really care. I mean, I mean, Gray was not a famous person at all during that time. So they just threw most of those chairs in the trash. Uh, <laughs> and it was only like 30 years later that a few of the surviving originals sold for like 30 million euros <laughs> at Christie's or something like this. But, but during the original, um, uh, during its lifetime or during her lifetime, most of her really intricate and, and fabulous designs were were considered without just any value and and, and mostly thrown away. Thank you. So except second part of Alien Green House, what are you working now? What's 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 the project now ongoing on? Uh, and what will be in the future? And I think it will be our last question because uh, that's the last chance also for and like mm, our viewers uh, to 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 eventually ask the last question. So so go on, go on, please, uh, guys. Okay. Uh, well, I don't have. I mean, <laughs> finishing this book was quite. Uh, it required quite a lot of energy, especially because I wanted to really make it not not spend too much time on working on it. Uh, I mean, by not too much time, I'm saying I wanted to spend like two years and not six. Not <laughs> because the timing in comics is just very long in itself anyway. Uh, so I'm taking a little break from 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 comics or longer book forms for now. Uh, and letting like the Eileen Gray universe unfold and, and, and reach more and more people, which makes me incredibly happy and, and talk a little about it. But if I ever, I mean, I will definitely go back to comics because I am a masochist, but once, <laughs> but once I do, I think uh, I will, I do have the urge to do something entirely opposite to what I did with Eileen Gray, which is something very closely analyzed. Like when we were writing the book with Charlotte, we were very conscious of all the philosophical and ethical and aesthetic choices. We were conscious of like the feminist history of design history of blah, blah, blah. And so it was like a very, very controlled process. I mean, I enjoyed it a lot, but it was also something very, very, closely closely designed so to speak so so i do feel the urge of making something really wild and uncontrolled next <laughs> maybe a series of, of of just weird publications without much <laughs> overriding sense to them so we are waiting yeah. and thank you so much for this incredible uh, presentation uh, and uh, thank you to have you here on behalf of Pogleski Pileski in Berlin and thank you, Monica, for last question. Yes. No, 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 no. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, hope to see you every uh, every month. Every month, um, in case of uh, COVID policy, we will we'll see or in our institute in uh, Berlin at Kaiser Platz um, next to Brandenburger Gate or on zoom it depends on uh, circumstances but it will always uh, uh, put it um, live transmission or here or in uh, facebook so please please look uh, at our uh, social media channels and our um, different uh, levels of communication as well and hope hopefully to see you you, yeah. see, you, uh, see you again see you in a mom <laughs> yeah and our guest can we yeah, yeah uh, it, it'll be, uh, it will be like a very important guest be because it's also like a, a co-curator of our project like living archives it's it will be only lost so we are waiting germany. Yeah, yeah from germany yeah so we are waiting for uli uh, uh, and uh, i i hope uh, that you enjoyed this uh, webinar with Zasia Dzerzhavska from Warsaw. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, so much for inviting me and thanks for listening. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Have a nice evening.